Welcome back to Progressions, Success in the Music Industry. Here we are, episode two. I'm not going to lie, I'm feeling some pressure today. Because this is it, I have to write my first opening to my first interview episode. And I told y'all I'd give you advice and tips that will make you more productive and more creative. Now I have to do that. So let's give this a try. I wanted to talk about staying focused and getting your work done, whatever that work might be. This is probably the second most important thing you'll need to master to have a successful career. The first thing being starting. And that's a whole other can of worms that we'll rip into another day. Today's world is filled with distractions and people are convinced that they can multitask and balance everything at once. And you can live like that, but you're not gonna be doing your best work and it's going to take you longer to reach your end goal. This topic, by the way, is inspired a bit by our guest today. He posted a book on his Instagram last year that caught my attention. It was called Deep Work by Cal Newport. In his book, Cal makes the argument that deep work is the ability to focus without distraction on a cognitively demanding task, and that it is a skill you can nurture and develop, like any skill. And just like any other skill, with no practice, you can get worse at it. The constant emails, text messages, and social media distractions of today cause most workers to never actually make it to a state of uninterrupted deep work. They're left intermingling what Cal calls shallow work throughout their entire day. And you and I have seen this happen, and we've done it. Everybody's guilty of it. I've seen people involved in sessions with their heads buried in their phones for 15 minutes before somebody says, where were we? All while the studio time clock is rolling. So I recently started running a timer to better understand how long projects were taking me and to help me build hourly more accurately. And also because I'm a bit of a nerd. A lot of a nerd, actually. So this timer pauses itself when the computer goes idle for a certain amount of time. When I'd look back at the end of the day and see all the gaps in the tracker, it was frightening. I was working four to five hours out of an eight hour day. When you see it on paper or on a screen, you start to understand why you might feel like you can never get enough done. That timer software is called Toggle, by the way. There will be a link in the show notes. But back to the idea of deep work. I'm not going to summarize Cal Newport's book, but I will give you my opinion on the concept. To work effectively, you need to remove the distractions. Not to say you need to lock your phone in a safe and delete your socials, but you do need to actively ignore these things. Try having a set time in your day for email, internet, social media, maybe at the start or at the end, or both. And if social media or the news gives you anxiety, then definitely don't do that before you try to dive deep into something, particularly something creative. You'll just be too distracted. So. Deep Work parallels a lot with several other books I've read over the last year. A book that is mentioned in the interview to follow called Getting Things Done by David Allen argues that the many open tasks or ideas that you store in your mind will clutter and distract you from the tasks you're trying to focus on. Now, that is, that is in no way what that book is entirely about. It is a far deeper idea than that, but that piece of it fits right in with Deep Work. If you're reading emails and getting distracted by unfinished tasks or potential gigs or phone calls you need to return, you'll never reach a state of truly productive work. And there's another book called The Talent Code by Daniel Coyle. I've been reading a lot of books lately, can y'all tell? Uh, so in The Talent Code, Daniel studies what he calls talent hotbeds to identify why so many extremely talented people tend to rise out of the same area or institution during the same time period. An interesting example that he uses, just to let you know, is a uh, Russian tennis club with a single court that has trained more top 20 female players than the entire United States combined. So anyway, one of the key factors to Daniel's talent code is what he calls deep practice. So wait, we've got deep work, and now we've got deep practice. It's starting to sound like success is heavily dependent on lots of hard work and not a lot of lucky breaks. So without diving into doctor-level nonsense, there is a science to this. Prolonged periods of focused concentration and practice builds up a substance in our brains called myelin, which essentially allows our brains to trigger commonly used pathways, translation skills, much faster. This is easily compared to the physical training that an athlete does. Work out a muscle and it will get stronger. So most likely if you're listening to this podcast, then you are a musician. Think about your performances and losing yourself in the music and jamming with your friends. You practice for years to get to that state of flow, just like an Olympic athlete trained for years for the first day of the games. Same goes for writing, painting, even reading. 
The more you do things with focused concentration and no distractions, the better you will be at them. If you want to make huge strides in your career, do the deep work on your trade. If you're trying to learn a new instrument or a new piece of software, do the work and do it uninterrupted. You'll accomplish more work, it'll be better work, and you'll only get even better as you do it more often. Well, that's it. That's my first intro. I hope it wasn't too science fair and book club for you. But if you are a reader, all of those books I mentioned will be in the show notes. And I encourage you to check them out if they sound interesting. So now, on to the show, episode two. Here we go. Today, we're being joined by six-time Grammy-nominated record producer, mixer, programmer, and songwriter Damian Taylor. Damian found himself in heavy demand early in his career after diving headfirst into changing technology and becoming one of the first masters of audio editing and automation within DAWs. His discography is filled with household names such as The Prodigy, Arcade Fire, The Killers, Temper Trap, and Bjork. In addition to his daily mixing and production projects, Damien has also recently started streaming live on Twitch and has launched a social network for producers, engineers, musicians, and music creatives called the Complete Producer Network. From my own personal conversations with him, I can say that Damien has a treasure trove of wisdom and is happy to share it with those eager and willing to learn. So on that note, welcome Damien Taylor. <laughs> Thank you, Travis. That's a lovely intro. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Thanks for joining us. So I wanted to touch on on the complete producer network for a second first. All right. I know that's not the beginning of your career. Begin at the end. I love it. Yes, right. Yeah. But um, I, I like what you're doing with that in your Twitch account because I feel like with the home studio world, the community is like starting to fade and I feel like you're trying to bring that back. Is that like, is that some of your inspiration? That is starting these things up? 100% you've hit the nail on the head. Um, it's the, I'm actually, you know, I'm in my early 40s now um, I wouldn't say I look it, but I've never been in a position where I've been able to like reliably hire an assistant or have an intern uh, or and, you know, it's been so long since I've regularly worked on sessions where there's kind of younger people around. So a big part of me was thinking, I don't want to take all this stuff to my grave. <laughs> <laughs> but the other part of me was thinking very practically, like I actually, you know, I'm still actually doing so much of the work that was the stuff that kept me busy that other people would hire me to do at the start of my career. So I want to actually actively be passing on a lot of this stuff so that I can literally hire people. Um, do you know what I mean? So it's kind of, and yeah. then also like once I started streaming on Twitch, which is much more like the social thing, uh, I just really enjoyed the whole process of not just me connecting directly with people, but seeing people involved in the stream, hanging out and starting to talk to each other. Um, and given, you know, around the Twitch world, there's, uh, for people who don't know, there's a, an application called Discord, which is kind of like Slack for gamers in a way. And I was kind of a little bit frustrated with how deep you could or could not go more specifically on Discord. So I wanted to kind of fire up some of those really fresh and really to kind of help all these people around the world connect. Um, and I think especially like one of the biggest things I actually get a kick out of from doing the Twitch stuff is seeing people from remote corners of the world come on. Because uh, I decided I wanted to be a record producer when I lived in the South Island of New Zealand uh, pre-internet. And that felt like kind of as far away as you could possibly imagine from New York or London or Paris or, you know, any of the kind of main music centers at the time. So I really kind of have a lot of empathy for people who are from remote spots and a lot of belief in people for, who are from remote spots and the fact that they can actually bring a totally fresh angle to things. So it's, you know, it's a lot, a lot of reasons. Right. No, it's. I, I think it's amazing. I, I love the interaction, the people that I've I've chatted with on there. Everybody's just like, it's the right mindset, I think, for, for people. Definitely, I think yeah. It's, uh, it's great. And it's, it's also, you know, the internet can be such a crazy place. So it's also even just like everyone who's been on the stream and that I've been connecting with directly is like really positive and supportive. So it's like, yeah. let's just, let's establish somewhere that's positive and supportive from the get-go. And if need be, I can like boot people off. And I have specifically said on stream, like I, the gender imbalance in music production is something that I really uh, am upset and even embarrassed and ashamed about. Uh, so I especially wanted women or non-cisgendered males uh, to feel welcome on there with a personal guarantee from me that if they ever receive any form of harassment, I would happily boot people who are misbehaving. So, you know, I think we just got to be proactive on a few things like this as well. That's amazing. No, it's, it's, it's what, what definitely needs to happen, especially with everyone being so isolated now more than ever. But yeah. Uh, 
so speaking of isolation and and uh, in New Zealand, so I feel like it's possible that you've maybe worked on almost every continent. I have not worked in Antarctica. Um, okay. And have, yes, I've worked. Yeah, basically. Otherwise, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, yeah. So let's go back a little bit to where you started and kind of see if we can pinpoint like maybe major turning points for you. Mm-hmm. I'm sure. I'm sure now that you look back, there's probably choices that you made where you were like, you know, that was big. My understanding, I don't know your story totally, and I don't want you to repeat a lot of things that you've said before. Mm-hmm. But you you began in London. Is that correct? Uh, After- well, I I started. The really simple thing is I started playing music when I was five or six, not to a terribly high level. That was in Canada. Then I did kind of, a, I was luckily in a really good high school music program till I was about 14 um, and then got really sick of the music that was in there and all of those things. So stopped doing music playing for like a year, then basically discovered a four track when I was 15. So I was in high school in New Zealand at the time then. So by that time, I was in the North Island of New Zealand in a slightly bigger city. But if there is a key turning point, it was like, you know, I started playing bass guitar and like jamming with a friend at school. And he said like, oh, there's a thing called a four track and you can put a cassette into it. And then you can't, it's not just that you can record a a thing, you can record a thing over the top of another thing. And again, reminder, this is like pre-internet, so you couldn't just go and Google it. So I just started looking in classified ads and sold my mountain bike that I'd literally saved up for a year to buy a four track. So that was like a key thing. Uh, But then I also remember um, there's like a high school careers day and actually that same friend, I assumed I was going to be a doctor at the time, but that same friend asked a career person in like a big school thing, like, oh, what about audio engineering? Um, And they said like, oh, well, there's like the school of audio engineering in Parnell. Um, So then I was saying like, oh, you can, there's like, you can go and learn this stuff. Like, that's crazy. Um, And then that also came into, I was in a, like a music equipment store, in Auckland and overheard someone talking to the owner about the fact that uh, he had a studio. So I kind of plucked up the courage and asked him if I could go and help because by that point I'd started at engineering college. Um, And then he hooked me up with an engineer who let me just go in and hang out on his sessions, which is an incredibly kind thing to do. And that's also, again, comes back to why I'm streaming on Twitch because like, you know, when I was learning, when I was in engineering college, the difference between like sitting in on a session and just seeing things happening versus sitting in in a classroom and saying like, this is a dynamic microphone and this is a condenser microphone. It's like fundamentally different. But then yes, in terms of like my career getting going, I actually worked for another year after I finished engineering college in New Zealand. And that was actually at a post-production kind of house and a place that wrote music for ads. Um, And because they wouldn't let me touch anything in the studio, that was where I very first started actively using Pro Tools. I'd used it a little bit in engineering school, but there's only like a four channel version. So I'd record sections of songs separately, like record separate sections with different drum kits on different parts of two-inch tape, and then f- mix them and then put them into Pro Tools and edit them together. Because um, you couldn't like drop in drum kits or whatever on on two-inch tape so much. So I was experimenting with that, but then that wound up being like putting footsteps onto people, Foley stuff, and then, uh, so that was kind of where I first started to really get into audio editing. But the simple answer is like, yes, London is where my career was built but I had a bit of a precursor. So you went to you went to London with editing chops in mind already, um, probably that maybe a lot of other people hadn't dug in that deep? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd been exposed to it um, by that point. You know, I'd been on plenty of sessions that was all recording on tape and at an engineering school, it was two-inch tape. Um, but yeah, so I, I had... Actually, what was interesting was this composer, they had a... I think they had a 16-channel Pro Tools system, um, so they would record all their music in Pro Tools. Uh, and then I was, it, when I moved to London, I was like, oh, I just want to be an assistant at either Strong Room or Abbey Road or Metropolis or, you know, but I sent out 42 CVs to every single studio in London. And one guy replied to me who had a studio literally in his living room in a house in Brixton. And I mentioned on my CV that I spoke a bit of French because I was Canadian and he, his assistant was leaving and he had a French band coming in. He was French as well. So he's like, oh, well, if you can speak French, that would be handy. So that actually wound up being my foot in the door but that studio is amazing because he had 48 tracks of ADAT a big 48 channel desk uh, a 2 inch studer and then a 16 channel Pro Tools system then he had like a little bedroom upstairs that had like an 8 channels Pro Tools system Um, but there's a very very clear moment Travis I need to tell everyone this Uh, there is the DigiDesign mouse mat and I just hit a point where I started like watching a lot of kung fu films I was like 20 20 year old 
dude like just moved to Brixton watching kung fu films that he bought from the market and they always have like these practice scenes um, where it's just like repetitive movement practicing and I'd been doing like a bunch of stuff flying stuff around on Pro Tools like really it was it's like you'd fly something off ADAT into Pro Tools or off tape edit it and then put it back on tape so you weren't running entire sessions off Pro Tools if that makes sense but the DigiDesign mouse mat just had these key commands on it and I was like I'm going to memorize those key commands and I'm going to be fast on them like Jet Li, <laughs> basically. And that was pretty much what kick-started my career. And just, you know, the fact that I learned that and then, you know, one thing led to another, uh, which led to Guy Sigsworth coming to that studio because he was looking for somewhere to do something with someone who was good on Pro Tools. And no one had really figured out Pro Tools in that sense at that time. So what happened was I figured out functionally how to turn a lot of guys' conceptual working techniques into a reality, but then also based on all the other ways that I manipulated audio, all the other things I learned, I was just like throwing, oh, we could do this and this and this and this. And Guy was really into kind of abstract like German techno groups like Oval, who their main instrument was like chopped up CDs and ground up CDs and like jittery digital audio. And he was, uh, he'd been in Bjork's band for her first two projects. And this was right before Bjork started doing Vespertine as well. And she was really taking an inspiration from this whole like digital glitch thing. So those kind of couple of layers of inspiration and then suddenly I'd like was able to master these tools where you could shred audio into a million pieces, basically. <laughs> Amazing. So so Pro Tools then really was kind of like a big door opener for you. So in we're we're in London right now, but mm -hmm. I think we skipped uh, we skipped why you went or how you got to London. Well, I just, all the music that I liked was in London. And in New Zealand at the time, there was like one half of one good band in the whole country. Um, okay. So that was just your, your was, I'm going for it. We're getting on yeah. the plane. We're going to London. We're doing it. Yeah, totally. Like all I wanted to do is make records. It was like, that was all I wanted to do with my life. And I feel very blessed that from about 15, 16 years old, I was just like, this is what I'm doing. And actually, when I was at my parents' place recently, my mom found, like, my high school yearbook or whatever, and it was, like, everyone saying what they thought they would do and what they're going to do. You know, and it, was, it was all meant to be this funny thing, and, uh, and mine was just, like, I think I'm going to be a record producer. I'm going to be a record producer. This is just, like, I, I put the exactly same... I, I put, like, some slightly pretentious kind of, like, angsty teenager thing in there about it, but it was, <laughs> like, I put exactly the same thing in both things. So it's just, like, this is what I'm doing in my life, and there's no two ways about it. There's no ambiguity. There's no question. It's, like, it's... it's it was literally, like, do or die for me. That's, that's what you got to do. You got to dive in. You got to start, dive in. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> so how, how much of the beginning of your career were you independent for? Were you working specifically for, like, that studio in Brixton? Uh, officially, that studio in Brixton hired me freelance. So I've actually, technically speaking, been freelance since I was 19. Um, and yeah, the studio in New Zealand paid me a wage. So pretty much the whole time. Uh, but that just, you know, for the studio in Brixton, just, I mean, I understand the business model. It just meant if they didn't have bookings, they weren't having to pay me. But what actually, I do want to say like the aside about that studio and what wound up being the blessing with it was, you know, I already felt I had a bit of experience. And when I met the owner, he said like, okay, well, you know, you can come in and like make the tea and tidy up if you want to. And I thought, oh, well, it's a step back, but oh, well. And literally like 90 minutes into the first session, he just kind of like looked at me and shrugged and left the room. So he just like left me to engineer everything that came through the door for the next year. And that actually wound up being like a really nice, um, almost like when you hear about these old studios, all the kind of classic American or British studios where it's like you'd record a jingle in an afternoon, then in the evening this would come in and then you'd do this. And, you know, it's like all these different things coming through. And it was like not a glamorous studio. It was advertised in the back of Sound on Sound magazine for like 25 pounds an hour. So you just get like anyone coming through. Um, but actually having that at the start of my career of just like, you don't know what's coming through the door. You kind of have to respond, get on the person's wavelength. And then the biggest thing I actually learned really in that year was regardless of what the type of music is, I learned to try to find the thing that that artist liked about it, if that makes sense. Because there would sometimes be records that I really didn't like but it was like, why do they like this? Like, I'd be watching them going, like, what are they kind of getting into? Where are they bobbing their heads? Where are they high-fiving each other? So it was a really, you know, I, I just kind of approached it as like a sociological kind of experiment. There's plenty of amazing records I got to work on as well. 
but like learning how to shift my perspective and shift my point of view when listening based on who was in there wound up being an incredibly useful skill. That's really interesting. I've never, I'd, I've been in similar situations and I've always thought, what do I like about what they're doing? I've never put myself mm. in those shoes, which is kind of like, kind of a great idea. That's what I should have done. But um. <laughs> Well, we all have our ways of coping, but I got to say, actually, when, when I was at audio engineering college, I was waiting on tables five nights a week. And this restaurant had like the worst record collection in the world. So when I was there, that's when I developed a switch that I could flip in my brain of like, I'm not listening to this music as a fan. It's just like sound that's on, if you know what I mean. Because they they had like three CDs. And so it was right. like a year and a half. One of them was like Ackerbilk plays, you know, Pops hits or something like that. Ackerbilk is like an old kind of instrumental clarinetist from the 60s. And then they had soundtrack to The Bodyguard, like no disrespect to Whitney. But if you hear that, like a hundred times in a year, you've kind of had enough, you know. So so anyway, there's there's lots of different ways of listening, but that that whole experience in Brixton wound up being pretty fascinating. Awesome. Uh, I wanted to jump on on your time with uh, with Bjork, which I actually don't yeah. know much about. We've never ever chatted about that. Uh, I'm guessing that you're, you're like constant embrace of technology and like being excited about like doing cutting edge stuff is probably one of the key elements of you guys working together. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm lucky. Again, I met Guy Sigsworth through this place in Brixton, and he was in her world, so I met her through him. Um, so the, I actually had like two separate phases when we very first met, which is when I was like 2021, 20, and we just got on really well. And um, they actually Bjork and her team asked me to come back and be the main programmer all the way through Vespertine, and then she thought about it and she's like, "Well, look, I met you through Guy. I shouldn't nick you off, Guy." So then they kind of like withdrew the offer, but I'd actually just, you know, this is, there's like a year or two that passed in here. I'd actually stopped working full time with Guy, but wound up like really busy on all this other stuff. So then I kept in touch with her manager every year or six months. I'd send him an email and just go like, hey, how are you doing? And so it was like about six years later, I got the call again. Um, and then that turned into like a six year run of working with her more or less full time. But the simple answer is like, yes, Bjork is an incredibly kind of creative, conceptual person. She's really hilarious. And it's just like a vibe working with her, if you know what I mean. So I was able to be on that side. Um, you know, it's there's no rules when you work with her. If um, she never wants to do like the same thing twice, um, she hates feeling like she's kind of repeating herself or doing things the normal way. So it's kind of like if you're up for the adventure, then, you know, then you can kind of keep up with her in a way. That's amazing. So I would imagine that probably pushed you on a daily basis then. Well, it's, I mean, it's interesting. I learned a lot from her. Um, one of the things I actually learned from her was don't work crazy long days. Um, so mm -hmm. in many ways, it was like, it was a whole, it was, it was like such a fundamental rewire of how I worked coming out of, you know, by the, the time I was with her more or less full time that it, I was super, super established in London scenes and really kind of like, come up and established my reputation by working 16, 18 hour days, six or seven days a week, like all the time. So when she would kind of come in at 11 and then leave around three or four, it was a bit of a shock. But, you know, so there tended to be like a more of like a quite a natural, I want to say circadian rhythm, but I think that's daily, almost like fortnightly rhythm where she would kind of be writing and thinking about things. Some days she'd literally just be writing lyrics so on those days, I was like the butler. And I mean that in a very nice way. I'm very, it's like all I needed to do to support the artist was like, here's some snacks, here's a herbal tea. Do you need some water? I'll keep out of your way. But then on days where it was like a singing day or a vocal day, um, then those were like hyper intense because it's like everything had to line up for those moments. You know, there's a, a bunch of background, like Bjork's really kind of mastered how to look after her voice. She came out of like the punk scene where it's just like you scream until your vocal cords shred. And... She's always had to have two days off between every, you know, time she sings. So that that whole kind of rhythm of how things fit around her vocals was uh, quite interesting. But, you know, there is a project we did called Biophilia, uh, which is the last one I did with her, which wound up being a nearly, nearly a three year project. Um, and that one, like I learned Max MSP and it was a massive challenge. Basically, she was just wanting to do this massive exploration kind of into the unknown. She didn't want to just make an album. Um, and the whole question of what this project was going to be at one point it was going to be a house in Iceland, then it was going to be a house in Iceland where every room would play music. It was going to be an IMAX film. Uh, then it turned into the world's first iPad album. The iPad came out halfway through. 
Um, but I, she wanted it to be about patterns in music and nature. Um, so we'd, you know, have all these massive, like, kind of conceptual discussions where it's really, you know, her, it's the concepts that were in her brain. And, you know, then we kind of discuss, like, what are ways of making things happen? But yeah, I designed all these systems where she could kind of perform electronic music live in an improvised way, but in a very musical way. And then a lot of those systems, the kind of music that came out of them in her hands turned into the songs on the record. And then there's variations of those wound up landing on the iPad album. So challenging in a way that you would never imagine when you decide, like, I want to kind of produce and engineer records. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you're diving into a new technology on a daily basis, iPad apps, yeah. Mac, Max DSP, just coding, just going, going yeah. all in. And so much of it was, you know, like I was saying, like she's always looking for something new. Um, and she's, in, she's fascinating because she's a huge lover of technology, but it's kind of our running joke where she'd say to me almost daily, like, hey, can you put this MP3 that's in my email into my iTunes? So she didn't want to like learn to code herself. She didn't really want to, she could, you know, she could operate Pro Tools to a certain level, but was like not interested in going beyond that level. It was always like, what's her big picture stuff? So it's kind of like this interesting challenge where you'd need to set up technical systems where she could literally pick them up and music would happen and then she could guide them. And, you know, I made her some Max instruments where it's like, well, if you click on this menu, then it'd just be like, forget about it, game over, like not going to happen. Yeah, it puts into uh, focus how important uh, like design and workflow is, yeah. um, especially in like a, a creative space. Like I know your studio, I think you you have very dialed in to just create, yeah, right, yeah. ready to go with the press of a button. So a lot of the conversations that you and I have had, we'll, we'll stray off of um, career for just one second. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about productivity and efficiency a lot. I feel like it's like this overlap that you and I have that we just like to geek yeah, out on. Man. Yeah. I think a lot of people would think of that and they'd say, you know, that's not a very creative thing, but I don't know how you feel. I feel like it actually makes me more creative if I'm more efficient. Is there a point in your career where you decided, you know what, I'm not going to work the 18 hour days. You know, this was working for someone as talented as Bjork and I'm going to design these systems and this is how I'm going to be and it's going to allow me freedom, really. Is yeah, there is a pretty clear delineation. Um, I wish I'd figured it out a lot earlier. And you're definitely preaching to the choir when you say like being more efficient makes you more creative. And like, we will fully unpack that statement. But like, I th that is, I think that's the thing that people really, really don't understand. So let, let's fully unpack that one. But getting to this very specific moment, um, you know, there, there was like this kind of, or there still is, I think, in studios, like this almost like macho badge of honor that it's like, dude, I was just in the studio for three days straight. And it's like, whoa, it's like, you know, when I was skateboarding when I was seven to a very low level, like if you got your skinned knee or whatever, then you're like, dude, that's rad, you're gnarly, you know. Um, <laughs> and it's almost like that with sleep deprivation in the studio. And, you know, we're getting into all kinds of like agrarian and industrial era views of work, which is that one hour of work equals one hour of results. And in the creative fields, that is 100% not the case. Uh, it's almost like the inverse curve. The more hours you put in, the worse the results get. Um, but the very specific moment, yeah, I went through a divorce about, I guess, six years ago. Um, and in the whole kind of aftermath of that, I wound up just thinking like, okay, how... There's a lot of factors, but it, that was still at a point when I was just thinking, oh, great, well, now that I'm divorced, I can work even longer hours. And there's actually a, a complete, um, it's a complete fluke. There's an uh, Australian-Canadian engineer producer called Burke Reed, who's absolutely brilliant. He does like uh, Courtney Barnett and lots of great records. And he was the one person I'd let use my studio in Montreal from time to time when he was in town. Normally he'd work on the weekends, it was great, but he said, hey, look, I've got this like 10 day mix and I need to be in there like really clearly from noon every day for 10 days. So um, I'd actually just started listening to this podcast called Cortex, which I think you and I have geeked out about. And I remember hearing one of the guys on there saying like, oh, I like to get up really early and write straight away, like before I even think about anything. And it's just like, that sounds weird. Like what on earth are you talking about? <laughs> but I thought, well, let me try a version of that in the studio. So, you know, I got up early and went straight to the studio and started mixing. And what was astonishing was every single day out of those 10 days, he was coming to the studio to start at noon. And every single day I was like printing a mix at like 11.53 or 11.56, like without fail every day. And that would include like I'd have a little YouTube break at 10 a.m. or whatever. And then I had the whole rest of the day to myself. 
to be like happy and relaxed and I'd already accomplished something. I was like, what the hell is going on there? Because normally I'd get to the studio around noon and then take a couple of hours to like get into the vibe and then reply to some emails and, you know, accelerate towards 10 p.m. or something. Uh, but then there's also, you know, I just really started to, I just needed to learn to clarify what it was that my mind wanted and I realized I didn't really have the system or framework to kind of pull a new thing out of thin air. And a lot of this is actually dealing with very functional life stuff, um, not necessarily in the studio, because as people may know, like if you've just got like a speeding ticket or you've just had an argument with your boyfriend or girlfriend or partner or something like that, you sit there with all these things rattling around inside your brain. And then, you know, the music can be sitting there looping and you're like, hang on, what was I doing again? Oh, yeah, that's right. I was kind of tweaking the bass. And then you saw, do you know what I mean? So just that whole ability to be present and create was massively compromised. And I just realized I needed to try to figure out how to handle all of that. I, I agree. Being present, I think, with all the people that I've worked with over the last, particularly in the last like five or six years, the constant distractions are, I think, are taxing for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, You know, if, if one person is on their A game and the other person is checking their email, all of a sudden mm -hmm. that A game falls off quick. Yeah, yeah. Or I'm, you know, I'm sure everyone's been in a session where it's a great vibe and then suddenly someone like yells in the corner of the room, like some expletive and you're like, oh my God, what's going on? And it's just like someone randoms texted them or even better, they've been on like social media and seen something outrageous that's happened and, yeah. then it's, and your whole session grinds to a halt, you know. Their fantasy football team. Yeah, totally. Just isn't yeah. doing that well, you yeah. know? Yeah. I've actually, I've worked with people while they've been sitting there on their phones saying like, literally like, I'm just having an argument with someone in the comment section. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, uh, yeah, man. anyway, it's funny. But the, yeah, the point is, you know, just having that dual axis of like, um, on the one hand seeing like, oh my gosh, I can get things done in incredibly short periods of time um, combined with there's all this stuff I just need to figure out how to handle on the other end. You know, right. that was that was a, the really big kind of instigator for it. So let, let, let's go back and, and get to the being more efficient ends up in being more creative. Mm -hmm. did, did you have any specific thoughts? Well, let me give you another example, right? Like you've mentioned, like my studio is all set up and ready to go. And even when I had my studio in Montreal, that was always like the goal. But I remember really clearly like things like, that studio was really big, so I had a ton of gear and a ton of instruments, and I'd sometimes be like working on a production or a remix, and I'd have this little voice in the back of my head, sometimes literally for days, saying, you know what, you should get like XY synth out of the closet and plug it in, because I think it's what this track needs. But I'd be like a little bit exhausted and a little bit dazed, and I wouldn't really take it seriously, or, you know, or I'd actually go like, well, that would mean I'd have to stand up and plug it in. You know, so then I never would. And then, you know, invariably on like day three, I'd come in and just say, let's just start the day and we'll plug this thing in. And you plug it in and it's exactly, it's exactly what you needed. You know, so there's that, that's, I think, ultimately a really, really good example of like what efficiency means. Just like how can you reduce the number of non-creative steps between having an idea and executing it? Yeah, totally. And, yeah. Redu and reducing the clutter, clutter in your mind, clutter yeah. in the studio. Yeah. Clear point A, point B. Exactly, exactly. So I did realize that we kind of skipped over your Montreal and transition to Los Angeles. Was there any big, big moments there where you were like, "Hey, I'm, I'm making a shift. I'm, I'm going here. I'm doing this." Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there was kind of there's like carrot and the stick involved. Um, like I love, I, you know, many reasons. I, I've moved around my whole life, so I'm very kind of comfortable everywhere in the world. I still kind of largely identify as British, even though I'm not. Like, I really feel like London is my city and the British are my people. Uh, but it's a very, very, like, cramped city to live in. Um, and at that time, you know, when I made the move was actually while I was uh, on tour with Birka because her musical director and played live electronics in her band um, for a year and a half. Um, so, and it had also come a few years into even before I started working with Bjork, like a very expansive period of my life where I was like traveling a lot and seeing everything that was out there in the world. And in London, and I'm sure it's the same, you know, to a certain extent, well, I mean, it's definitely the same in New York and LA to a certain extent or any large major center there, people love to have like this kind of prevailing wisdom that like, oh, unless you live in London, um, you're nobody. 
And so part of me just straight up wanted to like look that assumption in the face and say like, I think, I think you'll find you're wrong kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> then there's also like wove into a few career things. We have talked about like how, you know, Pro Tools really launching my career. Um, you know, we touched on the fact that there's all these creative things you can do with it. But I'm also I'm very happy to say I'm like one of the best Pro Tools editors on the planet in terms of like corrective editing. So, you know, vocal and instrumental editing. And so I was so highly in demand for that kind of stuff, which was great to get my career going. But then I would also be known as like the Pro Tools guy, which is great. Right. But it was, I think, the fact that I had like a much broader perspective on music, which is what made me really good at Pro Tools. So Pro Tools was like a, a symptom, not the root reason. So basically when I was on tour with Bjork, what was amazing was I would meet all of these musicians at festivals and it wouldn't be like, oh, you're the Pro Tools guy. I'd be like, whoa, you play that crazy flying saucer in Bjork's band. Do you know what I mean? So it's like you're meeting people under this fundamentally different situation. So part of it was like, I'm just going to move to a different part of the world um, and kind of kick off a new chapter of my life, um, like quite deliberately, even down to like my identity. Um, and I yeah, just was meeting so many people as well so many people from outside the kind of scene that i'd come from basically so i really wanted to capitalize on that combined with uh by that point my daughter had been born uh who was wonderful and uh her mom was australian and both of us were like feeling like we didn't want to raise her in london um and the rest of the uk wasn't feeling so good either australia was a bit far away so I was on tour and wound up back in Canada for the first time in 20 years. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have a passport for this country. We could just walk straight on in. And so that's what we did. So we actually wound up being on the West Coast for a couple of years, which was amazing. I bought like a big F-150 pickup truck and rented a cabin off Garth Richardson, who's like a really heavy rock producer who did like Rage Against the Machine, F you I won't do it, you tell me. Uh, so I'd like drive the pickup truck up to the studio and chop wood and it was like super cool and like bears would wander past a window and for someone who'd been in London for 10 years like that was incredible and then I'd get to take the seaplane to Vancouver airport and fly out to New York to do a session or like fly to Asia for a tour so that was pretty baller uh, but then ultimately it was like a little bit remote so uh, we felt we wanted to be in a city with a little bit more happening I remember actually I was, I was up in this cabin in the middle of nowhere saying I really need a cello player and then realizing like, oh, I'm like way out in the middle of nowhere. So wound up in Montreal uh, as a result of that. And Montreal is kind of, you know, it's like the North American Berlin or like the Canadian Detroit where you can get warehouse space. And I, it was a point where I realized the way the business model was going was you had to be a producer with real estate, basically. So that would wound up being a place where I could build a studio. So I kind of built my dream studio there. Uh, and that kind of kicked off like, you know, six, seven year run in Montreal. That's awesome. So then you uh, you actively kind of removed yourself from being the Pro Tools guy by making that move. One hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do, have you have you done anything like that um, again or before? Like actively kind of tried to make a gear shift and just avoid you know? Yeah, I mean the, the phone call. For I this? would say less in an actively avoiding way, but moving to Los Angeles was definitely like seeing what was good and what was bad about being in Montreal. So what was good about being in Montreal was the city was phenomenal, really beautiful place, the food was great, um, but the Canadian music scene as a whole is largely run by the grant system, which is a good thing and a bad thing that I'm quite neutral on this. Um, luckily, most of my work was international. Uh, my management was in the United States at the time in New York. So what wound up happening was the majority of my work was remote mixing. Uh, which I loved, but after doing it for a number of years, it's almost like, you know, after a number of years of Pro Tools kind of being the core of things. And I want to be really clear, it's not exclusively what I was doing. Like I was co-producing, I was writing, I was, you know, programming, doing all kinds of creative stuff, but it was kind of like the core around which everything was happening. In Montreal, it wound up being um, remote mixing was the hub around everything. So it wound up about 70% of my time was remote mixing. Um, and so I just actually wanted to be around people more. Um, and, you know, writing music is actually what got me into recording. So I'd always felt like I'd never really spent as much time writing as I'd like to. So I kind of came to LA because it's such an actively collaborative city. And also I'd been in Montreal for seven years and London for 10. So I just needed like to not have brutal winters. 
Right. Yeah. yeah. But it was great exactly. to really, you know, and, and it was, I, it's interesting, actually, when I moved to LA, I really found, you know, I did the whole usual thing. You move here the first month or two, you're doing a ton of meetings with everyone. And then I think it took me a while to really get a sense for how the city works. And it was very different to the way of working that I was used to that I'd come up through in the UK, which was that you tend to have a meeting with someone. And then if you got on with them or you do a day and then it's like, okay, cool. The vibe is good go do something together for a couple of weeks or for a month and see what gets out of it. And in LA, it's like you have a couple of hours with someone and then that's it. Do you know what I mean? And it's like it's a hit record or it's not. Yeah, Uh, which I honestly, I think is a little bit stupid. I mean, I actually think it's, it's pretty stupid, but I also get it. And in terms of how it fits into like this whole model of working and you know the whole process of artists coming in to like work with a whole bunch of different people so it it took me a little bit to kind of just define like okay where are my boundaries where are my parameters how do I want to fit into the system um you know I still did plenty of mixing still do all my production stuff and I'm I'm quite selective about writing dates um and rather than just willy-nilly writing with anyone for any reason I really prefer looking for like who's an artist that I really believe in that I believe I can build a good relationship with and then how can we you know, start to build a longer term relationship together, even if it's based on like, well, let's just write something in an afternoon and then, you know, maybe you see them next time they come to town. But there's really a case of like trying to figure out how to collaborate and get very clear about what I want in my life to look like. Yeah. Right. Well, I think um, I just wanted to highlight for for the audience the, the skill of that you clearly have of kind of deciding how you want to shift is something that I think a lot of people do don't have. I mean, I know, especially I've been in LA for my entire career. I I know that a lot of people, you can get pigeonholed. I mean, in the same way that an actor only does action films, you know, this guy only does pop records and he only produces them. He doesn't mix them. You can, when you're in that community, you can get very, uh, very pigeonholed. And I think that people have to remember that you might have to do something drastic to kind of shift people's view of you and mm-hmm. moving and and all the all the choices you made are are great. I mean, it's it's I think a problem a lot of people encounter. Yeah, so. I mean, I, I got to tell you a story actually about this guy Neil McClellan who was really pivotal in my career. Um, I was lucky when I started working with Guy Sigsworth. I convinced him to get a programming room at Strong Room in London, which has ten kind of long term programming room production suites. I think they call them in LA, and then five commercial studios. Uh, and then a bar, so it's like this massive, massive hub. Neil is like, basically, when we were carrying Guy's gear up the stairs, Neil was like the first person I met. Um, he's kind of like this super like long-haired, really small dude who was just like, hey, man, how you doing? And, and he was like, what do you do? And he basically, he had done like Prodigy, Firestarter, and like all these amazing records, um, and he just kind of got me straight away. He actually came up through being a runner at Strong Room. And then he had a massive breakthrough when rave music happened in the UK. And basically he said that no one would really let him in the studios. He was kind of like a bit of a joke in the studio. But that one day he was on reception duty and someone phoned up reception and he goes, hello. And the guy goes, all right, mate, got any good bass sounds? And he goes, yeah, man. And the guy goes, all right, then I'll, when's your next booking? So he basically booked himself to do the session with this dude. Because he'd, he'd been messing around with, like, the sampler. It's kind of a little bit of a precursor of me with Pro Tools. There is, like, samplers, and he would go and mess around with them. Um, so this guy comes in. Neil spreads out all his floppy disks, and he loads up the first bass sound. And the guy goes, no, 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 that's not it. And he loads up the second one, and the guy's like, no, 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 mate, that's not it. Now Neil has three bass sounds. So, <laughs> so it's like <laughs> two strikes, and he loads up the third one. The, guy was, the guy's like, yeah, man, that's wicked. Um, so then they use that in a track and that track wound up going to like number one in the UK charts. Neil always tells a story. It's like he went into the office after this guy said he was going to book them and told everyone that he was doing a session and people booked and he said everyone just laughed at him. Right. So it's like and then he had a number one record and went and joined this guy's band and like blew up. So you need it's like amazing. these kind of extreme moments um, of change, you know. And it's, I mean, it's weird. Like I always talk about the irony of like the number of times I'd meet people in studios or be like, hey, I've done like all this incredible work on the studio on these very specific records. And people, you know, I had like a good career, but people weren't all like banging down my door. But then if you meet like Ronnie from The Killers in Brazil while you're playing like a table that goes woo with Bjork and you you say like, you know, um, hey, if you ever want a hand in the studio, like let me know. And then, then I got the call for The Killers. 
you know. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, he wants he wants to work with the guy playing the table. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Actually, Brandon Flair is I was chatting with him, and he goes, um, "He's a, quite a funny guy, Brandon." He goes, um, "Hey, we're working with Stuart Price, and are you to Bjork what he is to Madonna?" And I was like, I, well, I mean, you know, the honest answer is no, because Bjork is not Madonna. And so you can't be the same relationship. Uh, but I was like, well, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm helping her out and stuff. And But we're, you know, we're working with a ton of people. But it's just like, yeah, people have this different perception, which is different to like if they'd walked in and seen like the back of your head up against a computer screen or something like that, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, Coming uh, coming to a close, I like to uh, I like to put people on the spot. Are we closing? I down. feel like we're just warming up. Oh, I mean, we can keep going. I can cut that out. <laughs> no, I think, I think I'm sure your um, listeners have a life. Um, but actually, so there's one other thing which might be useful as well, just around what you're saying with the whole big shift. Like, I've moved around my whole life. Like, London is, the I think, the seventh city I'd lived in. And my parents met, they're British, but they met in Hong Kong. Then they lived in Northern Ireland, then Germany. Then we lived in three cities in Canada. So it's like, I'm just so used to kind of moving and being in new situations um, that I think like that kind of, maybe I didn't realize it at the time, but that kind of openness to like, oh yeah, you can just move to like the other side of the world and just like do something. You know what I mean? Like it's always just seemed like a very, very natural step to me. Whereas probably now at this point in my life, I'm a little bit less like, oh, let's just move to a new continent, you know? Um, right. Yeah. Right. Oh, I think a lot of people, it's that first step, whether you're making a record or you're moving to a new city, that's, mm -hmm. that's the hardest. And you've been around a lot. I haven't I haven't been to a million places, but I've been to a few. I find that the more places you go, the smaller the world gets. Yeah, you run into people like yeah, totally. You know, in in Brazil that you met in Germany or yeah. or whatnot. It's it's kind of a weird a weird experience. So people definitely need to do that. Yeah, and um, there's don't, nothing. Uh, don't stay in one place. <laughs> there's nothing nicer than meeting friends from one part of the world and another part of the world. It's it's gorgeous. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. It's really good. Mm -hmm. um, so. Can I put you on the spot then? Yes. With uh, what's a current big goal for you? Whether it's it's a work thing, it's a personal thing, whatever. And what are you uh, what are you gonna do first to get there? Well, the big goal for me right now is building out what I'm doing on Complete Producer Network into what you might call Complete Producer University. Um, so it's like I've been casually sharing everything I've learned in a hangout situation on Twitch, and I'm setting up. Uh, the infrastructure to actively teach people. Uh, so like actual kind of comprehensive syllabus. Um, and that's kind of part of, I started thinking this, I've been thinking it for a few years, but at the start of this year, I was like, I need to get really serious about rethinking my entire approach to the internet and people around the world. Because, you know, I felt like I was reacting a little bit against... Um, social media and, um, you know, the kind of what's, what are the accepted norms about what we're supposed to do on social media and how that's supposed to fit into our career. And all of that doesn't resonate with me. It all kind of sounds like bullshit to me. Um, but I knew that I wanted to find an authentic way to connect with people and to share knowledge and to share the music that I was working on. So it's not just like, it's part of a big web of how I would like to re-engage with the world much more directly, whether that's with artists or with the end audience, and also to create a different context in which I can be creative as a producer and collaborative. And you will have seen like a lot of glimpses of that on the Twitch stream, where it's like really opening myself up to ideas and concepts and sounds from people all over the world. Uh, but I have a... a frankly massive vision <laughs> for how that's going to it, it's going to be like this kind of seamless intertwining of all aspects of how you make and release music so that's also why the complete producer network is just a name off the top of my head but it's like i want this to be everything you kind of need to know to make stuff basically right um, I had actually set up a label a couple of years ago and had like a side project and i felt all these things are like completely separated they're nothing to do with each other um but i really want to answer the questions of like how can you learn everything you need to learn or you know learning is a never-ending thing how can you constantly be learning how can you constantly be creating how can you constantly be sharing your work with the world and how can you constantly be finding the people who are on your wavelength who want the results, the products that you're making, in other words, a finished record, but also the people who want to learn from you and share from you and how can you connect all these people 
and how can that kind of be a seamless whole? So that is the big thing that I'm working on right now. Um, and that is in concert with uh, my normal work, mixing and producing. Um, I, you know, massively raised the threshold in terms of what a project needs to be for me to say yes to it. Um, so I'm kind of, you know, opening up some space. The second part of your question, which is what am I doing next about it, is I'm actually like doing a ton of learning and studying at the moment because there's a whole massive raft of new skills and new knowledge that I need to make that happen. So I'm trying to become the kind of person who could pull this off, basically. That's good. I mean, I, I was actually gonna gonna go back and highlight the fact that you said uh, constantly be learning just a minute ago, and I think that uh, everybody needs to constantly be learning. I definitely had like a chunk of of time in my life where I didn't learn anything mm. for a couple years. You get depressed, don't and, you? Yeah, you do. And when you when you bring that stuff back, like it, I mean, it's exciting and you kind of like invigorating. And uh, I mean, digging back into like learning new skills, even if they're unrelated to music, mm -hmm. whatever they are, yeah, learn how to do this or do that. Uh, just kind of, it just gets me back to being super excited about everything. Yeah. So I think people need to, they need to learn. It's Keep weird. Learning. I mean, I, I think. I think the idea is starting to get out there into society now, but you know the the whole classical idea of, oh, you're Travis, you're good at this one thing, or we learn things until we're like eighteen to twenty two, and then that's who we are for the rest of our lives. Then like we stop learning. Like that's been this kind of assumption in at least Western civilizations for quite a long time. Um, yeah, and it's not remote. It's not even not that it's not true. It's that it's actually like detrimental um, to us as human beings and we can be learning up until the day we die and in many ways learning will be the thing that actually extends our lifespans because it will keep our brains like actively regenerating and new connections forming and all this kind of stuff and yeah life just gets I think like really boring if you keep doing the same yeah. thing day in and day out I agree I mean I think people they like you said they learn and then that's what they do for the rest of their life and then I feel like there's a turning point where uh, if you want to do something else, you have to pause and then you have to learn it. Mm. It's not like you, you can't learn. People think they can't learn skills while doing things or that, you know, like, well, if I want to have a career change, I need to go back to college for business or I need to go back to college for whatever yeah, it is. Totally. But no, that it should, it should be a free form thing and you can just learn as you go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Like with us being freelance, it's like you really get used to that whole, oh, I'm like the captain of my ship. And if I need to get the map to know where we're going, then I'm going to go and get the damn map, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> or something right. like that. And then the, 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 I guess the audio analogy is like you can crossfade areas of your life. It doesn't have to be like some hard cut, you know? Um, like, it's like, you know, you're launching the podcast while you're still doing your studio work. It's not like you have to stop in the studio to do this other thing, right? Right. No, yeah. it's a, learning, a, learning a new thing, get a new thing going. But what amazing. about you? So, what, what, Dave, what's what's the next thing? You're, what? What's the next thing you're doing? What's the big thing you're working oh, on? Oh no! <laughs> oh, flipped it back around yeah. on me. Um, well, this obviously this is this is big. Yeah. Um, and it's been it's been time consuming and it's been learning. So I have a goal of to get this live. We'll leave dates out of it, but I have a goal of being live in a couple weeks. Amazing. So I don't know when when this will air, but. Um, What's been the most yeah, just, challenging thing for you to learn getting this going? Or like, what was the biggest kind of mental block for you? Or like, what was the thing when you thought about doing it that made your stomach tremble? Uh, well, probably this part, probably interviewing people. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the one that gets my stomach trembling. Yeah. But uh, I would say the thing that I learned the most is I've done, you know, I've done one thing for whatever, 15 years mm -hmm. that I feel like I'm really good at. So I don't really think too far ahead when I know like if we're going to do this in the studio mm -hmm. like I just know how to do that right you can turn up I have yeah. definitely learned yeah that I need need to make a little bit more of a business plan sort that out a little bit more mm -hmm. I've, I'm learning new things like oh, I'll launch this on September 1st and then I'm like oh, it takes two weeks to get to Apple podcast okay right. Well, all right well September 1st is out yeah um so uh re remembering that you have to go back and plan through doing what I'm talking about right now is breaking it down to steps that's what that's what I'm learning right, right now is that right. I need to preach what uh Practice what I'm preaching here. Yeah, nice. Um, this might be a candidate for getting edited out. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I think it's good to have it in. Like, actually, I was, I was um, a guest on a very early episode of another podcast, which was um, kind of talking about all different aspects that an artist goes through. And I just, I do genuinely want your listeners to know a little bit more about you. So, I mean, yeah. like, you know, the, well, 
can I ask you another question? Do you mind? No, go for it. Like, you know, like the, your, you know, the kind of fundamental core of this podcast, which I love is like productivity and efficiency and how that relates to creativity. I just want to straight up ask you a question, which was like, what was, was there a turning point for you where that became clear that that was something you wanted to do? Um, it was, you know, probably, honestly, probably the first time that we got coffee was, was a, oh, big, really? a big moment because yeah. I was, I was becoming very interested in some of these like productivity and like kind of changing your mindset towards things. And then to meet somebody that had a similar mindset and a successful career in music, I was like, oh my God, this guy is doing this stuff that I'm thinking about that feels weird and dirty and <laughs> look at him. And then, uh, so that combined with, what did you tell me to read? Uh, getting things done. Mm -hmm. And somebody else had suggested getting things done. And just the one sentence in there, um, if it takes less than two minutes, do it. Yeah. It's not, it's somewhere in the first chapter there. Yeah. Um, I mean, that sums up what, what people need to do. You're like, okay, I go through my to-do list, need to do this. Yeah. It takes less than two minutes. I mean, it's, I love that you mentioned that because you know that little story I was saying before about like literally plugging in a synthesizer, something that's like that simple can become like this insurmountable exactly. obstacle if we're, if like our brains are just kind of like full of crap, basically. Exactly. You know. Exactly. Well, if, if you're interested, then. <laughs> I am. I, I do, uh, since, since you're, since you're asking me questions, mm -hmm. I am planning on, um, on doing this to myself for an episode, mm -hmm. and I was I was debating having someone ask me the question. So, if you're interested, oh yeah, I love asking questions. I, I would. Uh, I love for the questions. I would let Travis. you host for a day while we while we take on me. Let's do it. All right, amazing. I'll I'll, I'll figure out when we're gonna do it. All right, <laughs> but uh, maybe awesome. maybe yeah, if that can be a little bit down the line, we should have like a Q and A episode. And maybe I could ask like some listener questions as well as like you know grilling you myself. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's figure that out. Okay, perfect. Yeah, we're making it way too complex Great. already, but yeah, yeah, it's fine. It's good. Oh, incidentally, um, I do want to let your viewers know, viewers, listeners. I'm looking at you, so I'm saying viewers. Uh, <laughs> Travis has done a phenomenal job of actually organizing this interview. I've done a few interviews, and Travis had a whole amazing system of just like cutting out about twenty back and forth emails. It was just like, do you want to do it? Yes. Then you get a thing that says hey, here's some things. Can you just put these in here and choose a time? So I could just do that all in one go. And then it was like a reminder of like, we're, we're doing this. So the amount of time and kind of bullshit basically that you saved through that deserves to be applauded. And if anyone else out there <laughs> has a podcast, I would like to suggest you could hire Travis for $500 an hour to be an interview <laughs> booking consultant. Um, and he will save you so much time and money in your life that it will be the best five hundred dollars you've ever spent. Or if you're a bit slow, maybe I, the I best promise 3, we can 000. do it in under an hour. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hour minimum chunk. But yeah, if you're if you're slow, yeah. it might take you a few. But uh, sincere, like I've you know done plenty of interviews for like major magazines and big audio companies, and no one had their shit together like you do. So, oh, amazing! Oh, yeah. I appreciate that. I was just <laughs> trying to make it as easy as possible for people. And you know, and you succeeded, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Well, cool. I'll I'll give it a little bit of an official close, but uh, thank you, Damien, for joining us. I, every time I talk to you, I definitely am smarter. Oh, bless you. It happens. Hope <laughs> yes. I hope. Hopefully, everybody else listening is. I think that maybe that's just times. like a relative effect. You're like that guy's so dumb. I feel really smart now. You know, in comparison, that is definitely not it. Not it at all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, but this has been a lot of fun, and uh, we'll you know we'll we'll chat again. Maybe, maybe here, oh, maybe we, somewhere else. We Who sure knows? will. Oh, amazing. Well, awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I do need to ask, um, do you want to tell our listeners where they can find you if they want to get in touch with you, whether it's Instagram, management, yeah. whatever it is? The simplest thing is DamienTaylor.com, uh, D-A-M-I-A-N, Taylor, T-A-Y-L-O-R.com is my kind of hub website. At the moment, it's like super, super basic, but that's got kind of links to everything. Uh, but otherwise, I'm here is Damien, again, D-A-M-I-A-N, on the grams. I'm here as Damien on Twitch. Um, I Twitch stream every Monday, Wednesday, Friday from my studio. So you're very welcome to come on there and ask any questions at all. Um, and there will be, like, links to Complete Producer Network and everything from there as well. Uh, so there's links everywhere, but DamienTaylor.com is the really simple summary. Awesome. And so all that will be in the show notes, so you can click on it, copy and paste it, and get there. So awesome. Thank you so much, Damien. See you next time, man. So that's it. Uh, that's episode two. That's the first interview show of Progressions. 
If y'all enjoyed this, please do hit the subscribe button, share with your friends if you think they would enjoy it as well. If you want to leave a review, please do. And uh, I look forward to seeing you next week.